Good afternoon, everyone. Well, Zainab, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you, Elevate and Sally, wherever Sally is. Um, I just had a baby three months ago, so this is my first speaking opportunity, I think, since. Um, so this conversation is around storytelling, um, and who better to do it than, than, than Zainab. I wanna, I wanna just quickly share that with everybody in the audience. Um, I'm the founder of She Summit, which is a global women's empowerment conference and an organization and movement. It's about activating organizations and individuals to advance gender equality and to realize and step towards their highest leadership. And Zainab was actually the first person to say yes to speaking at my conference in 2012. Um, and so I've, you've always had a, held a special place in my heart for that. And I, I really think of you as literally one of the icons of, of this generation's global women's movement. I often talk about how it's a macro movement today. Like, I believe we're in the fourth wave of feminism, and um, it's not just one movement. There are thousands of movements, um, whether it's, you know, I mean, domestic movements, um, you know, movements and in industries like closing the tech gender gap to um, areas of a woman's life, like the confidence gap to, globally so many issues. And so when I think about the global icons, um, you know, people that really have been around the world and traveling the world to affect change and bring voices and awareness to women and women's issues, you really are just, your face just pops up right there for me. So thank you for all the work you've done. And I think, you know, since Women for Women International launched um, in 1993, it's gone on, this organization that you founded has gone on to serve over half a million women in war or conflict-torn areas around the world. Um, and your journey has been tremendous. You left in 2011. I think we would just want to start off with you sharing with the audience your story to now, um, you know, why you left, what that journey was like, and what you're working on today. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of questions. But um, first of all, it's a pleasure being here. It's a pleasure being with you in this, um, in this surrounding. As Claudia said, I started Women for Women International when I was 23 years old. I, had, I, I grew up in Iraq, so I was a recent refugee, or not refugee legally, but immigrant to, from Iraq. And this time I would be probably deported, but it was another era. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I had no experience, no nothing, but I grew up in war. And when I came to America and learned about other wars that are happening around the world, I felt I had a responsibility. And I felt I had a responsibility to do about what other women are going through because I was living in a country now that, is, that does provide freedom, the freedom of expression, the freedom of actions, things that was not available for me when I was growing up in Iraq. And so for many Americans, I think they take that freedom for granted, maybe not these days, but generally, they, you know, it's like sort of the norm for me, it's not for granted, it's actually a privilege. Um, and, I, and I decided that I have to do something when I see other women suffering, when I can do something about it. So it started with that journey of helping women in Bosnia, a country that I did not know anything about. I did not even know of its existence, but I felt its responsibility, that responsibility. And I started with helping 33 women in the Bosnia war back in 1993. And long story short, you know, 20 years later, we end up helping uh, 400,000 women and raising $100 million. And it made me believe yeah, that if you. I, <laughs> um, thank you. And it made me believe that I, if I, an immigrant, English is my second language, my family is from Iraq, I could not see my family for nine years. I started my life in America with $400. If I could do this, than anybody else could do it. There was nothing, anything special about me. I still don't have anything special about me. It's just the only difference in my, I came to realize between those who follow up on their dreams and run with it and those who don't, it's not the dream, it's not the idea, it's not the validity of the issue. It is, in my opinion, perseverance. You must be stubborn and a believer 
in what you are doing for an idea to manifest because you face, like Mount Everest, a million hurdles and you get to do it. Now, 20 years of doing that, 18 years as a CEO and 20 years in the board, I decided to leave the organization. And a lot of people are shocked and surprised that I'm the founder, the face, the CEO, the one who built it from zero to a hundred million dollars organization. How could I leave it? And for me, I did that. I, I always say I am as proud of leaving Women for Women International as I am proud of founding Women for Women International. And, and I did that for many reasons. A, I was studying in women's studies when I was um, in, in college, and I did not want to be what they call the founder syndrome. I did not want to be that older woman who grew with the organization, and as I grow, it becomes static, and it becomes boring, and it becomes rustic, and it, be it does not grow because I am holding on to it and refusing to let it go. So I vowed for myself when I was 23 years old that I will leave it when it's 20 years old. <laughs> and I actually am very proud of myself for having done that and walked my walk and, and talked my talk. The second thing is we criticize many leaders. At least I come from part of the world where we have a lot of dictators and a lot of authoritarian people and who never let go of their leadership. And I felt like, how can we criticize these leaders? How could I criticize Saddam, for example, in his time, or other authoritarian leaders for holding on to power if I do not exercise the meaning of letting go of power in my own small life? And so we cannot talk about these others, and I believe right now in everything, we cannot criticize those others if we do not understand and walk that journey ourselves and understand what it means to walk that journey. And the third thing is I actually, 20 years of doing the same work, I, you know, in, in all honesty, I was no longer, my, um, it, was the same, it, it, it was the same journey and I was no longer growing. And it's hard to admit for a founder and a CEO and a, an icon and whatever to say, I am no longer growing and I actually want to do something that triggers the agents of change. So I was always seeking, what is the secret sauce to create change in women's lives? And I experimented with all kinds of programs, educational programs, humanitarian programs, microcredit programs, and every one of you and everyone in the world says, this is the program. If we only focus on education, we can make a difference in women's lives. I actually really believe these are all tools. They are strategic tools that we need to give women all over the world in different parts of the world. And women need all the tools. There is not one tool that is more important than the other tool. Economic empowerment is not more important than education nor vice versa. But if we talk about one secret agent of sauce, I believe it is inspiration. What all what women need ultimately is to know that they do not have to live the life they, they are living and they can indeed fulfill their full potential. And that inspiration is conveyed through storytelling. And that's, you know, TV and movies and books and articles and gossip and radio and blogs and all kinds of things. And so I switch from the sort of, I, I don't, for me, women's issues is my passion and my commitment. And I will draw, will die trying. That, I mean, that's how much of, I'm, uh, this is my path in life. But I switch from the humanitarian side, which I felt that we're like resolving the crisis that other people are creating, which I believe in the humanitarian sector, to the inspiration side, to the media, where how do we actually highlight and feature stories where women inspire each other and we inspire each other. All what we need to do in this journey for me is for each one of us to own our voice, break our silence, share the story, and that story becomes like a candle in another woman's cave and helps her get out of her cave to the possibilities of change and difference. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I think what, what we'll do is we'll talk about the Zainab Sabi project towards the end, because I want to sort of stay on this thread around how this audience, and I know many of you are entrepreneurs, and some of you work in corporate, or maybe in career transition, and, and this whole, how they can learn from you in this, because um, you're owning, you own your story, right? And and your your journey, you know, has has obviously is the story, but there's so there is so much fear, right, wrapped up in all of it, and and to show up, you know, authentically who we really really are inside. I believe that visions are casted on us all the time. The universe is casting visions on us, and most people abandon those visions. And it's it's almost like your destiny, your you know, is like tapping you on the shoulder, be like, come here, do this, be really who you are, but. We're so afraid to because you know because of all the you know and again this is America right where you know you know it's it's expensive to have children it's you know it you you, you know there are all the practical reasons and safety reasons of quitting your job following your dream so how do you know how do how does this audience um, how do you really stay rooted in that you know because you have that quote, you know, you have a choice every day, either you can show up and, and live your life out of fear or live it out of love. Like, how do, how do we get rid of that fear? You know, how do we listen and follow what we, you know, our authentic journey and story and what we really want to do, you know, and, and, and have that courage, if that makes sense? Um, so it's not an easy process. And, you know, I, was, I can only tell you about my journey and briefly. First, we think about women's rights as I want to help other women be empowered. For me, women have their own power. Their issue is not power. Their issue is a platform to be heard. We don't have, we are not heard, but we have our own power. And that is not a cultural issue. I don't think women's issues as a cultural issue. I was one of the people who said, I want to help these other women in the other parts of the world. In the third world, in Afghanistan, in Congo, in my home country, Iraq, all of these things. And we often think it's a third world women's issues. Well, it was that quote unquote third world women that taught me the connection between the individual story and the larger collective of women's stories and how it is important to break our silence. And it was briefly a Congolese woman, homeless, raped, her children are raped, horrible, horrible story. And she said, if I can tell the whole world about my story, I would. So other women would not have to go through what I have gone through. But I can't. You can. You go ahead and tell the world the story. And I'm summarizing that story, but it was in the most humbling moment in my life. And that most humbling moment in my life came from an illiterate, homeless, Congolese woman because she had more consciousness between the connection of her story, if she can break the silence of her story, maybe other women would be spared what she has gone through. Her issue was she did not have the platform. And most of us here, I assure you, we see her and we feel so bad for her. But she, in essence, she should have felt bad for me. And it was humbling because I felt I am preaching for women to stand up and be empowered and speak up and all of that. But I was hiding behind all of these other women's stories. And because I grew up in privilege, I don't think I have a story. I didn't think I have a story, but in essence, I believe every woman has a story. Now, if you do not have a story, then you are truly privileged. And, and God bless, you know, thank God. I always say that, you know? But most women have a story. These stories sometimes are big. These stories sometimes are small. These stories, someone, because someone told us something that hurt us or someone behaved something at her. And we all pretend that we don't. It's only the other woman has it. But over time, I came to realize that our own courage, our own guts, our own confidence to sort of stand up and speak up and really tell our truth is not a class issue, nor a cultural issue. It is an individual issue. Most of us, we try to pretend that it's all good. It's a great package. I have it all done, by the way. It's done. It doesn't work like this. It's a struggle on, it's a testing process on a constant, constant level. 
And again, like the climb too, you know, it's sort of, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, so nothing to this, but it's a struggle and it does, to live your truth requires a sacrifice. And we, li we live in the, in the era of perfection and success and we celebrate entrepreneurship and go do it. You should go do it, but let's talk about the challenges. Because it's not unique to be in these challenges, but every time I speak my truth, every time, whether it is to start a project that I believe in, or whether it's to tell my family something that it's upsetting me, it's constantly like a leap of faith. It's a constant moment of sitting on the, standing on the cliff, not knowing, do I stay in the safety of this unhappy marriage, or do I jump and tell the truth that I am unhappy? Do I stay in the safety of this unhappy job or unhappy whatever, or do I jump and tell the truth that this is no longer? And every time you jump, it's a leap of faith, and most of that entails going through the abyss. Everyone, again, we only celebrate the end tale of the story. We only celebrate the success of Facebook and all these entrepreneurs and how they made millions, but we need to discuss the abyss as well. It, and how you are tested and challenged and judged and all of that. And your core has to be so strong. That it's, and that core for me is between me and myself. And maybe one or two people who believe with me, in me. But you, it's, it's, I share this because it's normal to go through that testing. And, that, and, and that's the one that shows you and it, your core. And all the time, you will land on your feet. You will land maybe on a broken feet. Maybe you will find <laughs> your wings and fly. Maybe you will land on, on a pool and swim. But you will land. And you will try. This life journey is not about success. It's about trying and falling and standing up again and trying and falling. And it's a constant. Uh, for me, it's a constant um, uh, challenge. Do I live my life out of authentic authenticity to my true values, or do I live my life out of trying to project an image that the society tells me this is what success is, and this is what beauty is, and this is what being happy is? And most of us go through what society tells us until we realize it's not working. <laughs> And to make it work, you're going against the wind. And that could be, in, in everything you're doing, you're actually going against the trend of a society. But as I, in my values, in, in my experience, the taste of freedom, and the freedom is to live true to yourself, it's so delicious that it is worth the hard journey of walking your truth. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm saying it's not an easy journey, but it is, wow, God darn it, it's worth it. It's just worth it. I just, I wanted to add that um, I have a book coming out this fall called This Is How We Rise, and it's um, how to reach your highest potential, but empower women and lead change in the world. And um, one of my big messages is that everything happens for you and especially the obstacles in life. You know, it's in many ways, obstacles can be blessings if you can actually pause to see the lesson that it's teaching you. And we wouldn't be interesting if our life was not full of hardship, right? So the journey is um, that perseverance that you're talking about. And you'll die, try, you know, trying to do it. It's, um, you know, I think so much of it is, is really just seeing that every single one of you in this room have a story and it's what you've been through. And the good stuff and the bad stuff has all happened for you to hopefully help you bring clo you closer to, you know, what I say, your purpose or your calling or your destiny. Um, so it's, you know, it's so beautiful because your message is, is telling women to do that as well. And, and we really need to own our story. And, and transparency really is transformational. Um, you, you look at my friend Gina Rosero who came out on a TED talk that she was transgender and now you know, it's a huge movement, right? It's, um, you know, there all the movement drivers, even Sally and, you know, the investment gap or, 
Um, you know, my message here is, you know, to really have everybody really think about, like, you know, bring your mission to movement. Like, what is your movement? We all have a destiny and a path, and our story is, you know, is, will help us define what that path is. So um, I just want to sum up here, and you know, thank you so much for sharing all of this, but just um, to share with the audience your current project, because I know you've got, you know, a, a, a big storytelling project that's about to launch, correct? It launched already. It launched already, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, before I talk to you on the project, why for me, uh, the, the, the new project is, is uh, you know, I, I switched to the media. I have a, a show in the Middle East called the Nida Show, and I have a show that I just finished in, in, uh, with the Huffington Post called the Zainab Selby Project, where I go around the world and discuss global politics from a woman's perspective. So we want to combat ISIS. We only talk about it from a men's perspective. And I, you know, did you know there are women who are actually dedicating their lives to beating the heck out of them, you know? We want to talk about terrorism. Let's talk to the mothers and the sisters and the wives of the terrorists and understand it from that perspective. And the reason I'm trying to do all of this and I'm trying to say all of this to you is we are in a very pivotal time in history right now. And it's not a good time. It's just a bad time, in my opinion. It's a time of fear, anxieties, division, blame. We are pointing the fingers at each other, and we are speaking on top of each other. And the way I hear what women are, you know, saying, I mean, like, it's almost like, you know, the old radio stations, at least I'm of the age where we still had to, like, adjust, you know, and hear it. Um, I believe we have the capacity right now to own our own voice and leadership as women. Lead like a woman. I think all of us, I mean, those who have succeeded in the men's world, sadly, to, to lead that, are coming back and saying, we were told to lead like a man and to succeed, and we did and succeeded, but we reached a glass ceiling there. And so we need to lead as women, and we need, and that entails tapping into our own authentic voices, as we stand up and speak, we need to speak from the core of our values rather than in reaction to what we are against. And that for me, how we lead is going to make a difference in this world today. And particularly in America, in this moment of America, but I believe all over the world as well that we can stand up and just say, I hate you, da, 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 all of these things, or we can stand up and speak about the core of the authenticity of our values and the humility of our journey. And we can make a difference if we own our voices, not from anger. I mean, you know, we all have stories, right? I mean, I was embarrassed and ashamed for the longest time to say I knew a dictator, my family was his friends, I was raped, I was in an arranged marriage, I was an abuser, there all of these things. So there's, so there's so much shame, and I, once I got it out in anger, you know, and I cr that's how I launched Woman for Women, was anger, like, ah, I want... And then eventually, you, you, when you lead with anger and in opposition, you become the very thing you despise. You create your own monster. And I'm saying that only because I have done that in my life. And you create your own monster, and that's when I realized I can no longer lead from anger against injustice. Now, the anger was justified against injustice, against all these rapists and killers and fighters and all of these things. And now I was like, we have to, I want to lead as a woman. And that means that I have love inside me and ability to hear and ability to show kindness and an ability to bridge and an ability to speak with integrity and not in anger. And these are pivotal moments. And then I have an opinion not only on women's issues, and I don't want, no longer want to ghettoize women's issues as only women. I actually want to own the women's journey. What are they thinking in politics and economy and all of these things? And this is, for me, a pivotal moment why we need to tell our story in a different way and in our personal life. And how do we lead a moment of transformation in this particular time in history? Thank you so much. I think we're up. 
lead with your values, and this is, this is the generation of female leaders, so take her words to heart, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia and Zainab. We um, would love 